now we're going to move on to the final phase of the program. And um, I, I wanted to, to, before Deborah DeMott comes up to, to direct that, I wanted to provide just a, a thumbnail background of where the award has been and what we've, what we've tried to do. Um, it is a broadly uh, defined award for significant accomplishments in the furtherance of fiduciary principles um, in the public sphere. Uh, not limited in other, any other general way. So this is our seventh year that we've done this award. And we give you an idea of where we have been. We started off with a, an individual who in some ways is well known at Harvard, especially perhaps, but also in corporate governance, uh, Robert Monks. Uh, was our first uh, awardee in, in 2013. Uh, he was followed by Gary Gensler, who had just left the CFTC and um, uh, surprised, I think, a lot of people in terms of uh, what he tried to do in that agency during, during his time. And then to come home to, to John's uh, place of, uh, of, of, of work, um, the next year, we, we awarded David Swenson um, our, our award. And of course, uh, what John referred to was well before David took over the endowment, I'm, I'm sure, uh, in that regard. Uh, then we went on and, and looked at another former regulator, Phyllis C. Borzi, who had spent eight years uh, uh, doing fantastic work at the Department of Labor to get through <coughs> that uh, fiduciary slash conflicts of interest rule um, that uh, unfortunately was essentially put aside by the current administration. Uh, then we worked, uh, looked to a, a, uh, a consumer advocate. And uh, in the world of consumer financial advocacy, there is no one that I think comes close to Barb Roper, who has been with the Consumer Federation of America for over 30 years, um, and where we were two years ago this year, uh, giving her the award. Then, then finally, just to make sure that people uh, understood that we understand that, that advisors themselves can also receive this award, we honored last year Harold Avinsky, who uh, now is a recently uh, retired uh, professor from Texas Tech, and but for the bulk of his career was perhaps the most well-known uh, financial planner in the, in, the, in the space. So that's where we have been in terms of the breadth and, the, and I think the depth of our awardees. And uh, I think that um, gives you an idea of sort of what we're, what we're looking at. So I, tomorrow and I are having this little discussion that's semi-public, semi-private. Uh, I, I wanted to ask, to, I wanted to ask Tavar to, to say a few words uh, okay, finally I twisted her, twisted her arm. You've got to get behind the podium. There you go. You may know it, but years ago, uh, I wondered where fiduciary law comes from. Where does it, uh, how does it pop up? And then I read a book, or I saw the beginning of a book, Why Do Monkeys Lie? And that, of course, is a very interesting topic. So I looked at the book. It was very, why do they lie? Why don't lions lie? And that led me uh, to understand how animals are reliable. They have it in their genes. Uh, so the queen bee or the uh, lion uh, don't decide what is good for them, what is not good for them. They have a function, and the function is to support uh, a group, and they follow it, and that's the end of it. Uh, when it comes to monkeys, however, which we are kind of close, long relatives, uh, they are not bound 
by genes as much. And the result is that when they cooperate, some of them cooperate less than others, but gain more than others. And that leads me to ask, how do humans do it when humans don't have those genes? And I came to the conclusion that fiduciary law is our genes, because if we can't rely on each other, uh, we can't live. We do. We must. So uh, this is why uh, I think this would be a good closing uh, remarks, why I hope uh, we will meet again next year. Thank you. So now I will turn the podium over to Deborah DeMott. Okay, good afternoon. Um, uh, in civilian life, I'm a professor of law at Duke University, and it's my, been my great pleasure the last four years to have chaired the nominating committee uh, for the prize. Um, just pulling a few things together um, as a preface to awarding the prize, uh, Canute opened this morning uh, by talking about the significance and the visibility and the contested nature of fiduciary standards in the context of uh, investment advisors and broker-dealers um, who make recommendations to their customers. Clearly, um, you know, the, the significance, I would say, the impact, the impact of fiduciary norms uh, is pretty significant. Um, the pr the pr our, for our prior awardees, uh, I would say one thing that distinguishes all of them, but this then would also be true of John, is these are all um, uh, persons who are characterized, among other things, by great persistence over time. Uh, they don't take setbacks easily. Uh, they have a strong sense of um, what needs to be done, and they uh, they persist. Um, so our oh my, it gave up. It gave up. <laughs> okay. Um, Okay. <laughs> so uh, the specific linkage uh, between John and at least this dimension of his lifelong work as an academic and in implementation in the in the in the world, um, his writings. And the, the and the, the concerns of the institute more broadly, uh, the specific linkage linkages will be illuminated for you by our next three speakers. So we'll first hear from uh, Robert Sitkoff, who is the John L. Gray Professor at Harvard Law School, and Rob will be coming up to the podium because he will in, in, in fact begin with a remarkably graphic series of images. Okay, uh, we'll then hear from David Seip, uh, who's a professor of law and law alumni scholar at Boston University, and then from his, his colleague, Francis Miller, who is a professor of law emerita uh, and continues to be an active and very distinguished um, teacher and scholar of health law but does have a legacy of teaching and other activities in connection with trust in the state. So over to Rob. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> okay, so uh, thank you. I, I'm Rob Sidkoff. I'm uh, delighted to um, say a few words about uh, John, his work, and, and this award, and how this uh, came to be. Uh, 
Those of us who know John personally know he's a devoted husband and father and a true and loyal uh, friend. He's been generous with time and attention for younger scholars. I'm also going to let this thing warm up. Um, what we're here to talk a little bit about is uh, John Scarley work and its intersection with uh, law reform, and in particular, the Uniform Prudent Investor Act, the rise of the modern prudent investor rule. I'm going to get a little bit alarmed. This is not waking up. Um, John's scholarly work spans uh, four different fields. I mm -hmm. want to emphasize his work in uh, trust and estates. To give you a sense of the significance of John's work in trust and estates, um, the case book that I teach out of and several others in the room has uh, four or five chapters organized along these lines. Um, old traditional law, John Langbein scholarship, John Langbein engineered law reform, and then more sensible uh, decisions thereafter. That's, that's four or five different chapters of the book that are organized in that uh, way. The one I want to uh, emphasize is uh, prudent investment, fiduciary investment law. And I want to do this with just five slides that end, we have two pictures. So here's, what, here's the world that uh, John found when he started teaching uh, trust and estates. We're going to do 300 years in like two minutes. So 1719, uh, uh, trustees were authorized by parliament to invest in the South Sea Company. It's not the best year to start investing in the South Sea Company. 1720, the bubble bursts, 90% uh, drop in a stock price. The lesson the chancellors took from this is that stock is bad. If you invest in stock, it could go down, so we shouldn't uh, do that. Produced a court list, a, a list up front of the sort of investments that would be proper or improper. Roughly, stock would be improper, uh, government and securities and um, well-secured first mortgages would be proper. All right, by the 1800s, these legal lists uh, are codified across the United uh, States. In 1830, here in Massachusetts, the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court, in a decision called Amory, Amory against Harvard College, actually, announced what came to be known as the prudent man rule, where you look to prudence, not speculation. What would a prudent, prudent, prudent man invest uh, his own uh, money? By the mid-1900s, this rule, the prudent man rule, is codified across uh, the country. We find it not only in statutory codifications, but the 1959 Restatement Second of Trusts. So the doctrine that John finds when he starts teaching trusts and estates and ERISA and the like is prudence, not speculation. But prudence, not speculation, as codified by the Restatement and by Austin Scott's treatise, turned into something a lot like the legal lists. It said that government bonds was presumptively okay in stock. Well, that could be bad, especially if it goes down. And if it goes down, after the fact, you could be exposed to uh, liability. So there are several problems with this, right? One is there's a focus on default risk, ignoring inflation risk, reinvestment risk, and the like. This obsession with default risk without accounting for risk tolerance and time horizon and so on. It invited hindsight bias. Uh, in a paper I'm going to talk about in a moment, Langbein and Posner identified a case from uh, New Jersey in 1931. Court said that everybody knew in August 20, 1929 that a crash was sure to occur. How could you have held equity, right, when you knew the crash was uh, coming? We looked at investments in isolation instead of the portfolio as a whole. If we understand anything from Markowitz, it's diversification. Okay, so what where, where happens? Uh, Langbein led a, a, a wave of scholarship in the late, starting in the late 70s, drawing on modern portfolio theory, which at that point was already now decades in. Later, there'd be a Nobel Prize for this that argued for portfolio as a whole of risk and return. Instead of looking investment by investing and investment by investment, asking, did that, was it a stock and did it go down? Because then you're liable. Saying, what was the portfolio as a whole? I don't know if Suntan Lotion Inc. is a good investment without knowing, are you also in Beach Umbrella or Raincoat Inc.? It's a very different investment based on what else is in your portfolio. And we should diversify to avoid idiosyncratic risk. We should align your market risk with risk tolerance. These are all first principles of portfolio theory, of portfolio uh, construction. So here's a picture of John Langbein on the left and Dick Posner on the right in the University of Chicago Law Library. This picture is from the late 70s when they began writing articles that uh, said this. I understand that they took a lot of heat for these uh, papers, that uh, Posner gave a talk at a, um, fin a finance conference where he was kind of booed off the stage and subsequent speakers warmed the crowd by making fun of him. There's coverage of this in the media. That's why I found this picture as a story about Langbein and Posner and their uh, cuckoo article here. So, so, you know, Posner went off to write seven other things that day, uh, but 
what came next was Langbein stayed at this. Uh, Langbein, that paper that Langbein Posner did, that series of papers, and Langbein's subsequent work provide the intellectual conceptual foundation for the 1992 interim revision of the Restatement Third of Trusts to announce a new prudent investor rule that is more or less a codification of that Langbein Posner insight from the late 70s that we should use MPT in fiduciary investment. To put this in perspective, this 1992 interim revision, it is to my knowledge the only time that the ALI has ever put out an interim revision to a restatement. It is also an interim revision driven by social science, an interim revision driven by social science insight that the modern practice had run beyond the prior restatement and that in light of where practice had gone and what we understand from social science, we need to have an update. Two years later, we get the Uniform Prudent Investor Act, which John was the reporter, the principal drafter of the UPIA. By 2006, by 2006, every state had adopted a version of that prudent investor rule. So that's amazing. 1992 ALI restatement, 1994 Uniform Law Commission statute written by John, 2006, every state clean sweep has uh, adopted this. All right, so does it, uh, does it matter? I'm going to show you a picture. This is the last slide, and then we're, we're done. So what's this a graph of? This is a graph of FDIC data of portfolio allocation by reporting banks. So any bank that's in the FDIC system that had personal trust had to report its asset allocation. When I say safe, I don't actually mean they're safe assets. We now understand that they may not be safe because of inflation and the like. I mean what the old law mistakenly understood to be safe. And stock, what the old law didn't like. Top line blue, that's the stock percentage year over year, 86 to 2008. The bottom line red is what the prior law uh, liked. Here's a line for the restatement. Here's a line for the UPIA. So that's pretty powerful, right? We see a, a, what looks like a mirror image shift from what the prior law preferred into, the, into stock, suggesting the prior law was constraining. So I know what you're saying, graphs can lie, show me regressions. We, we did them. This is true. This, this is what everyone is saying. This is true. This really, this happened. Now, I just want to say one last thing about that. This is not a curious artifact of me and my trust that my dad created for whatever. This fiduciary investment law is personal trust, so it's a trillion dollar range now. This is um, charitable endowments, and these are pensions. ERISA follows the modern prudent investor rule with portfolio as a whole, and if we look at Supreme Court decisions uh, applying ERISA's prudent investor rule, they cite the Restatement Third and the UPIA. It's all the same rule now. So I'm now talking about literally tens of trillions of dollars. So let me say this one more time in a different way. The asset allocation, the day-to-day -day fiduciary management of trillions of dollars of fiduciary uh, assets has been altered in a beneficial way thanks to the scholarship and then the law reform undertakings of John Langbein. Thank you. Hello, I'll just say next, uh, I'm David Seip. I'm here on the faculty of Boston University School of Law, and I, I add to the greetings that we heard from, uh, from uh, Dino and Wachi Willig. Uh, BU has been teaching trusts and estates for, since 1872 when we got started. I'm the current successor in a long line of trusts and estates scholars, and you'll hear from my immediate predecessor, who was uh, award-winning for her teaching. Um, I also, sh uh, I also bring greetings from uh, Professor Maria O'Brien Hilton, who uh, sent me an, sort of an anguished email last night that she'd, she'd wanted to come to this, she'd planned to come to this, but circumstances intervened. She's our ERISA scholar and has been, uh, like me, uh, uh, therefore a student of, of John Langbein's for many, many years. I'm, I also share with John uh, the field of legal history. That's when I first started getting introduced to John Langbein's work, 30-some uh, uh, 
uh, 40-some years ago when I began that study and he began that writing. Um, just to give you an idea, this is uh, what I'm having my students read for my Thursday class. Tuesday was already done over the weekend. And so um, on the third page of reading is John Langbein, Substantial Compliance with the Wills Act, 1975, a full page uh, quoted from John going on to the next page. And the last page of reading has his picture uh, from, uh, not with Posner back in the 70s, but it looks like about in the 1990s, 2000s. Um, a little bit better than, yeah. So uh, his, his influence is absolutely pervasive. I, I consider this whole uh, experience uh, today a master class for me as a, as a teacher of some years standing in this area. Um, and I just say we are, we are thrilled both that there is a prize and that T Tamar Frankel gets her name on the prize and that we're giving it to John Langbein, who's been a good friend, a great scholar, and someone from whom I've learned a lot. Uh, I now want to turn things over to my predecessor at the podium of Trust and Estates, Fran Miller. And, uh, and an alumnus of this month. <clears throat> well, as I said to John during the break, I fought like hell not to speak to him. Be, I mean, today, but I, I, I lost that one because he came up to me. I've never spoken to him in my life. Uh, probably one of the few people in this room who never have, uh, who never has. But I've heard you speak on many, many occasions uh, at various conferences, etc. cetera. Uh, but uh, I certainly understand from all of what all of you have been saying today that I missed a trick by not having uh, come forward earlier to talk to you. But I do feel that I know you, and not least because of that picture that's in the casebook that I taught out of for, I didn't teach out of it for 44 years because I was Scholes and Halbach before, but I have read your words over and over and over again. But what I really wanted to point out was to go way back in history, not bring it forward the way, um, excuse me, Rob did, but go way back in history to 1975, when I was a lowly instructor at this law school, and the dean called me in and said, and this was something like August 20th, and he said, Fran, I'd like you to teach trust and estates, you know, in two weeks. And I said, I never took it. And he said, not to worry, you know, all you have to do is stay 20 pages ahead of the students. Not true, <laughs> but uh, I, you know, being a lowly instructor, uh, women except for Tamar, with whom I never could have survived, did not teach at Boston University Law School. So I did, I started teaching uh, two weeks later, and every night as I drove home on the Massachusetts Turnpike, I wanted to, hoped my car would go off the road because I knew I was just, I didn't know what I was talking about. And then I discovered, in a most fortuitous moment, your article on substantial compliance. And I said, oh, okay, now I can start understanding what I'm doing. So you would have no idea, but uh, you helped a uh, very green and unknowledgeable person make the leap and uh, make it through. So for that, I thank you very much. And even though I'm sorry I talked to you half an hour ago, <laughs> I hope we can continue the conversation. Thank you. that's really striking about, um, I think about John and John's work and uh, the last few comments is, I think it's, it's, it's all an academic could ever wish for. I mean, on the one hand, uh, John clearly has had, um, I've never been your student, but I would imagine that the classroom experience was m memorable and remarkable and your students learned a great deal. The reason I have some confidence in saying that is I think I told you last night 
I've read your essay on how to take and how not to take law school exams. And it's occurred to me that to be able to write that essay, one person would need to have been very thoughtful about being a teacher and a teacher in the classroom. Uh, we also learned what an impact on individual readers and scholars your writing has had. Uh, no doubt Fran Francis, Professor Miller's story would not be unique among those who've taught trusts and estates. I learned at dinner last night uh, that several people wound up learning that they were to teach trusts and estates from a phone call from the dean, including yourself, John. <laughs> okay, and then what a wonderful thing to be able to do, to turn to the, to, the, to the published work of someone like yourself. We've also learned, of course, and I think the, the images that Professor Sh uh, Sitkoff shared, including especially the last one, the graph, relatively few of us have a quantifiable impact in the aggregate. Okay, and I would think, and I hope we could agree, impact toward the good and very broad spread good um, it's from our, our scholarship and, and our um, sustained commitment to, uh, to law reform, the law reforms that it, it, uh, that it implies. So it's my honor to um, award you the object <laughs> that is emblematic of the, um, the Frankel Fiduciary Prize. Uh, you're joining a very distinguished list right, of folks, but I think you all have um, uh, some deep similarities that would explain why the Institute has determined that each of you in turn should receive the prize. It's also, of course, especially wonderful to hear from our namesake, uh, who was able to uh, to be here today and speak. So, John, if you'd like to come up to the podium. I, I speak with confidence about this. I actually don't know what this is. <laughs> Dinner. Dinner, maybe. It's heavy. Uh-oh. It's a heavy something. All right. Mm -hmm. Thank you so very much. All right. Uh, my gratitude to the uh, Institute and its uh, selection committee. I appreciate very much being uh, decked with the mantle of Tamar Frankel uh, uh, and her uh, sustained achievement uh, uh, in uh, this uh, field. Uh, I also uh, want to thank those of you who have uh, <clears throat> uh, come to participate in the seminar. I'm uh, I, I have learned uh, uh, from these remarks, and uh, uh, one thing I've learned is the paper I've presented here is not ready to see the light of day until, until I do some more uh, work on it, which is exactly what I had hoped would, uh, uh, would uh, come from this uh, discussion. Uh, so uh, thank you, uh, thank you all, uh, and uh, uh, I, uh, uh, promise you that at some point I'll get this paper in print and uh, when I do it will acknowledge the uh, discussions uh, uh, here today uh, at uh, uh, BU and uh, in the, in, uh, in the contribution of the, uh, of the Institute. Thank you. Thanks so very much. Thank you.